you. It is a joy and a privilege to stand in this place on today. It was no, no hesitation when Bishop um, called me and asked me if I would come on today. And of course, out of obedience, I got permission from my bishop uh, for the fact that he's out of town. So I try to make sure that I'm in place when he's not there. But uh, this day was established from the foundations of the earth that we would gather in this place on today together. Now, because I am not at the St. Paul Church, I need you to do me one more favor. I need you to put your hands together and open those mouths and give God some praise like it's your last time. We bless his name. 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 God is good and he's worthy to be praised. How many of you know if it had not been for the Lord on your side? How many of you know God has been providing for you when you can provide for yourself? You know God has been making a way for you when you couldn't even see the end of the road. How many of you know God is a healer this morning? Hallelujah. 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 Oh, my, 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 my. Oh, glory to his name. I say glory to his name. I say glory to his name. Hallelujah. 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 I don't know about anybody in here, but over the last several days, I've been going through a whole lot of stuff. For a matter of fact, over the last 30 days, the enemy had released on me all kind of attack. I had death in my family. I was rushed to the emergency room. I had death of a friend on last week. But if it had not been for God on my side, I would be in a cuckoo house right now. God, we thank you on this morning. And God, we give you praise. For you are worthy of our praise. For if it had not been for you, Lord, we don't know where we would be. If it had not been for your grace, if it had not been for your mercy, we don't know where we would be. But because of who you are, Listen to the word of the Lord coming from Joshua chapter 1, verse 7. Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, reading from the Good News Version. And this is what the word of the Lord says. Just be determined, be confident. And make sure that you obey the whole law that my, Mo my servant Moses gave you. Do not neglect any part of it. Watch this. And you will. Not maybe, but you will. 
not I'm thinking about it, but you will succeed wherever you go. Here it is one more time. Hear it in your spirit. Just be determined. No matter what you're facing, be confident. And make sure that you obey the whole law that my servant Moses gave you. And do not neglect any part of it. And you will, somebody shout, I will, I will. succeed wherever I go. The word of the Lord is already blessed. Now, Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. For you are my strength, you are my redeemer, you are my everything. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you all so much for allowing me to feel like I'm home. And, of course, whenever I come to the Citadel Church, um, it's never short of that. Uh, I thank God and bless God for bishop and first lady and the entire hill family amen and to each of you my brothers and sisters in christ it's so good um, to see you and to be here again and of course i want to acknowledge um, the best thing that ever happened to me outside of jesus and that's my wife I bless god for her being here uh, I, I don't I don't say stuff I don't mean from the pulpit. So when I say she's the best thing that ever happened to me outside of Jesus, uh, please understand that because uh, I'm just a mess waiting to happen. And I'm a fool and I'm crazy and all that stuff just rolled up into one big old ball of nothing. And some people discovered that's who I was and they left. But for 16 years, she'd been walking with this mess. For a matter of fact, when we, um, when I told her that God told me that I was supposed to marry her in the 12th month and on the seventh day, and uh, when we got married, I told her, I said, now listen, here is, here is what's going to keep us. Do not put all your trust in me. Because I'm, again, I'm serious. I'm a mess waiting to happen, right? I have some issues. And I always been saved. I was I was born with a calling, but I wasn't always saved in preaching. I say, but if you put your trust in God and you keep me in front of God in your prayer life, whenever I go looking for trouble, God gonna make sure trouble done change that number. God gonna make sure trouble done moved. God gonna make sure I can't find trouble. Not because of me, but because of her prayers. So I thank God for her press to be here on today. Uh, I, I want to share. I want to share from this subject on today the ingredients of living your best life. The ingredients of living your best life. As I have stated, as I stated a minute ago um, in the praise and worship moment, um, the last thirty days for me has been hell. It's been been hell. Uh, even though that um, there was times where um, the sun was shining and the sky was blue and the clouds were as white as snow and the birds were singing their favorite song, there came a time where there was midnight. And some of you know how that is. You can wake up and you can declare and confess that your day is going to be the best day ever, but in a matter of minutes, your whole day can be turned upside down. Do anybody know what I'm talking about? So I, 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 I've, I've experienced this over the last 30 days, and um, I had the death of my aunt, who was very precious and dear to me, having to uh, funeralize her after coming off of a tremendous weekend of ministry and riding home, I get the phone call that she had transitioned. Navigating through that whole time of emotions and the absence of her physical presence, uh, things got hard.
hard and then um, dealing with a migraine headache for five days at a level 10 my wife rushed me to the emergency room only to find out that they were admitting me not because of a headache but because they detected a heart situation life can change on you and life can flip the script on you life can throw you a curveball um, when you're not prepared for any of it. And then just the other day, I get a phone call, a text, and from someone that I haven't spoken to in a long time and asked me a question, had I heard about a friend of mine, and they said, give me a call. And I knew that call wasn't going to be a call of joy, but I discovered that my friend had, um, had transitioned, had suddenly um, been taken away from us. So life can just throw you a curveball. And if you're not careful and if you're not grounded in a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's like my grandma used to say, there's a storm out on the ocean and it's moved this away and if you're not anchored in Jesus that storm or uh, drift you away and with all of this said and all of this craziness that's around us and everything that we see happening in our society we we're living in a world where so many people are on this quest for what is being coined as living my best life and all of us in here, my brothers and sisters, we desire for this best life so much that we're trying to make every opportunity to have this best life. We're trying to make sure that we have everything that we need to declare that I'm living my best life. But what I have discovered that our best life is not grounded in tangible things, but your best life is grounded in, a, in an amazing and a unique relationship with Jesus Christ. And please understand, and I'm not suggesting uh, that something is wrong with living your best life. I'm not suggesting that something is wrong with going after the things that your heart desires. For a matter of fact, geez, God lets us know that he would give us the desires of our heart. But I want to say to someone today that make sure that your desires are in line with the will and the purpose of God for your life. If, see, I, I've gone after things. I've gone after people. I, 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 I've, I've chased after um, the American dream only to discover that God has something else for me. And I've attained some things that I wanted outside of the will of God. And what I've discovered is just because I had it didn't mean that I had the peace of God with it. Some, some of you chase relationships and some of you are praying for a companion or a mate. I want to say suggest to you that what you need to pray for is that God will reveal to you his will and purpose for your life and who fits in that. So we all come to church and we get, we get an amazing life change and a, a word that's going to transition us to the next place and the next level of our lives. But sometimes we have this spirit of arrogance that we can do it and get it all on our own. But I, I, I want to say to you that if you're trying to get something that is not in the will and the purpose of God, then you're just spinning your wheel. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And as believers, uh, we, we should live our best life. I'm, I'm not going to suggest that. For a matter of fact, one of the things that grieves me so much is we confess that we're in this relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is the best relationship that um, we have. But yet we walk around as believers looking and feeling defeated. We, we do more complaining about those outside of God than those that are with God. We, we complain about how hard life is. We, we complain about what we don't have. We complain plain the fact that I don't have enough money to make it to the end of the month. Haven't God told you that he shall supply all of your he, he is the provider. So God wants us to have our best life. And we, we have, we, God has ordained for you to live your best life. And if truth be told, living your best life as a believer is God's desire. God loves you so much that you want, he wants you to have your best life. And why do I say this? Because Jesus said that I have come that you may have life and have life more abundantly. If you're going to have the best life, you're going to have everything that God has for you. Living your best life starts with you understanding that God desires for you to have a best life. And living our best life as believers should, watch this, should reflect two things. It should reflect the love and the favor of God. 
to when, see, when people see you living your best life, when people see that um, you're walking in the joys and the peace of God, they, they, they're going to want to know how can you be in this place when all hell has broke loose in your life. And the only answer you can give somebody is because I serve a God who loves me. But the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Then you can declare that uh, I have the favor of God. Now, I know they say favor, not fair, but I believe favor is fair when I'm in the will and the purpose of God. <laughs> it, it, it's fair for me to have the favor of God when I'm walking in obedience to God. If I'm seeding and I'm blessing people, then the favor of God is that God shall return to me everything that I've given to him. Favor is fair. When, when, when people see you living this best life, it should speak to who's on your side. Not who's in your corner, but who's on your side. See, it's a difference than having people that's in your corner because some people in your corner is just watching and waiting for you to fail. But when Jesus is walking by your side, he's walking and navigating you through this thing called life that we have no control. For about, but let me tell you this. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't ha matter how many degrees you have. It doesn't matter where your house is and, and how much money you have in the bank and what type of car you drive. What really matters is that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And in obedience to the will and the purpose of God and the commands of God, then God will release to you everything that you ask God for. Does anybody understand what I'm, what, what, what I'm saying? Living your best life is not based on any of that. It's based on the reality of your relationship with God. And there's a whole lot of people who have all these things and they're not living their best life. So, so what, does, what does living your best life look like? What is the ingredients for living your best life? We find it right here in, in this text. Here, here's a young man who had been serving up under the servant of God named, um, named Moses. And Moses is now dead and, and Joshua is being raised up now to lead the people into the place that God has ordained for them to. Joshua, this young man, had been serving up under Moses he had he had been reaping the benefits of being um the second chair leader to Moses he he walked with Moses for a matter of fact he heard Moses wondering and and talking to God about um about where God was taking the people so he was accustomed to serving but now God has raised him up to lead the people into the greatest season of their lives and I just want to tell somebody um God has removed move your comfort zone so that you can lead not just yourself but those who are attached to you to the greatest purpose of their lives. So now that Moses is gone, Joshua now finds himself in the center of this whole story of the people of Israel and now he is at the charge, he has been charged to lead them into this place and God has this conversation with Joshua and whenever God is elevating you, God is always going conversation with you. See, what you got to understand is what the old saints used to say, every now and then you need to have a little talk with Jesus and tell him all about your troubles. See, that's what we're missing as believers. We don't, we don't have that conversation with God. We complain to God, but we don't have a conversation with God. So, so, so this is what this is what God is saying to Joshua, and I think it will help us as we pursue um, our best life. Um, he says this. He says the first thing he says in chap in verse seven. He says, "Live or be determined." So, so here's your first ingredient. Your first ingredient is you have to live a determined life. Listen, what the text says. It says, "Just be determined." Just be determined. When, when you're determined, determination doesn't start in actions, but determination starts with a decision. My decision is that I'm going to make this firm decision, watch this, that nothing or no one, not even myself, is going to stop me from going after my best life. 
See, 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 you have to be, you have to be persistent, my brothers and sisters. And when you're persistent, there's a drive in you that, that no matter what comes my way, it's not going to stop me from getting to where I want to be in life. Some, some, some of you have delayed where you're supposed to be. Some things that God has spoken to you over the course of your life, but you didn't have, you didn't have enough determination. So the first obstacle that got in your way or the first person who told you that you wasn't going to be able to make it or the fact that you looked back over your life and you saw where mama and daddy came from or you saw the life that grandma had come from and you declared that I'm not going to ever be better than where I am because that's just the life that I have. That's the hand that has been dealt to me. But I come to tell somebody that when you're going after your best life, you got to be determined. I don't care where mama come from. I don't care where daddy come from. I don't care all of the hell that I've gone through. I don't care who's walked out my life. When I am determined, I'm going after what God has said to me. As much as I love Paula Nicole Cotton, she can't stop me from going after the things that God has for me. I tell her in a minute, I got to do just what God has told me to do. And baby, if you're smart enough, you'll grab hold of this coattail and you'll take this ride with me so you can benefit from it all. Some of you know that you should have finished school by now, but you've been trying to calculate. You get that calculate, that ca that credit card, and you get that calculator, and you've been trying to add up what you got and what you don't have. Let me tell you something. I got three degrees, and I ain't make no more money until I got my degrees. Why? Because I was determined that this was the course and the purpose of my life. Can I be honest with you? I've gone through hard times. I've, I've had people walk away from me. Had that happen over 20 years ago. I was married to a young lady. She woke up one morning and said, this is not the life that I want. So I'm leaving. My attitude was, I'm going to give you everything that I've tried to give you over the course of our relationship. And that's one thing, that's happiness. And if it'll make you happy, then go ahead. But the enemy played tricks on my mind. The enemy had me one day to get in my preaching suit, my black suit, and put on my white shirt and a black tie. Then lay down in bed next to me was the Bible was on the left and the pistol was on the right because the enemy was telling me that you wasn't going to make it in ministry. Your ministry life was over. Nobody was going to want you to come and teach their leaders anything, and you couldn't even maintain your own house. But I heard in the far distance a tape that I had playing by Bishop Eddie Long who said that I've gone gone through a divorce, but look at me. Here's the truth of the matter. You got to be so determined that no matter who walks out your life, you know that you still got your relationship with Jesus Christ, and that's all you need. You got to be determined. And when you're determined, there's three things that comes out of determination. The first thing is that you focus, watch this, on your past success. God always gives you a rearview mirror. There's some things that you know in the past that you didn't think that you was going to be able to succeed, but God gave it to you, and God gave you the capacity to make it. Well, when you got that type of history in your life, every now and then, you just need to look back over your life and see where God has brought you from. The other thing about determination is you got to have a passion to see yourself win at every level. The challenge that most of us have as believers is we don't have enough passion in us. That passion gives me that tenacity. That, that passion is what wakes me up early in the morning. That passion is what makes me stay up and burn the midnight oil so my businesses and my education can be where I need to be. That passion is what makes you get there early and leave later. How do you know you got passion? You know you got passion when you go beyond what everybody else around you is doing. Here's the other thing about passion is passion um, gives you that drive not to quit. Listen, I know it's going to get hard. For a matter of fact, I want to tell somebody, I, I don't want to sugarcoat anyone. I don't want to think, want you to think that going after your best life, um, you ain't going to have no heartaches. You ain't going to have challenges. You're going to have some big challenges. For a matter of fact, the moment you declare that I'm going after my best life is when the enemy is going to show up. See, he's been playing with you. He's been tapping you on your shoulder. He's he been jugging at you. But the moment you declare that I'm going after my best life, he's coming with the best artillery that he has. But I come to tell somebody that when you have the drive to be successful, you're going to work past it and you're going to get over it. 
So the first ingredients of living your best life is you have to be, you have to have a determined life. But here's the second thing right here out of our text. The second thing that God tells Joshua is you have to be confident. If you're going to go after your best life, you have to live a life with confidence. And, and what is confidence? Confidence is simply, uh, is simply this. It's about having an attitude that I can achieve the life that God has ordained for me. Yeah, it, 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 it's, about having, it, it's about having that attitude. Confidence is an attitude. Confidence is that too. Uh, I, I grew up and people used to always tell me, um, Scott, you're so conceited. I used to say, I'm not conceited. I'm just confident. I, I, I'm confident to be a little black boy from the north side of town when teachers in elementary and teachers in middle school and, and even a teacher in high school told me that I wasn't going to graduate and I wasn't going to pass. But I had confidence. Why? Because I knew what was inside of me. I knew I had the capacity to win. I had people telling me over 22 years ago when I started in full-time ministry, man, you ain't gonna, you ain't gonna survive that church. That church ain't gonna, that church ain't gonna help your life. That man, what you doing? You walking away from a job that's paying you that kind of money just to go into a ministry, and they already told you that they're not gonna be able to pay you what you make on your job, and you still gonna go. Well, here's the truth of the matter. God told me that I never leave you nor forsake you. God told me that He will supply all of my needs according to His riches and glory, and I said to God that if I go work in your kingdom, then anything that I lose is more of a statement of who you are than who I am. So I walked in St. Paul over 22 years ago with the, with the confidence swag. I walked in there, never working in ministry before, never even really served in ministry. I went to church like, like everybody else. I went as a casual believer. I went, got me a word, and then I would go home, and I would get my drink on until Monday morning, and then i start my whole week. But you know what? When I walked in there to do this assignment for God, I walked in there with confidence. Why? Because the truth of the matter, I lost some battles, but I ain't never lost no wars in my life. So when you have this confident life, it, it, it's believing in what you can achieve. In other words, it's knowing your capacity. Now, capacity ain't always about what's inside of you. Capacity is what you're able to build around you. See, I ain't know how to do ministry, but I built a team around me to help me accomplish what I needed to accomplish. That's just like when you go buy a house. Ain't, don't, don't, very few people know how to build a house. But the capacity to build a house you dream of is getting people who can hear your vision and build it from the ground up. You got to have confidence. Another thing is you got to believe in who you have around you to help you achieve your task. Listen, if Joshua was Moses' assistant, don't you think God was going to give him an assistant? Why? Because God already knew that the journey to the promised land and the enemies that was around him was too large for one man to accomplish by himself. So he said, my servant Moses has died, but now I raise you up. Now, in order to be a theologian and you understand scripture, sometimes you got to read between the lines. Here's the between the lines. He wasn't going to leave Joshua to by himself to get the people who was complaining about what they didn't have versus what they had when they was in slavery. So the between the lines is, and I want to suggest that theologically God understand that I got to put some people around him. Listen, your best best life is not going to come from you by yourself. It's going to become by who you have around you. So here's, the, here's the third thing about confidence. Third thing about confidence, you have to have some God confidence. You, you, you have to have some God confidence. God is bigger and more powerful than you. You have to put your trust in God. So here, here, here's what happens. Here's what happens. God says, God said to, to Abram, he said, I want you to leave. I want you to leave your land. I want you to leave your family. Leave all the things that, that you're comfortable with, all the things that you know. And I, says, I, I'm gonna, I want you to go to a land that I'm going 
to show you. I, I want you to go to a land that I'm going to show you. And here's a man who started out to a land that he did not know if he was going to where he would be until God showed it to him. So here's what happens to us. God says to you uh, that he wants you to go someplace. And when you get there, he's going to tell you that that's the place he wants you to be. Here's our life. Now, God, where's this place? And um, um, what, what it looks like. And we get energized. We, we get what I call the Popeye spirit. We start to go, but we haven't even got further enough to even start complaining to God. And we say, wait, 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 not God, God I, I don't know where I'm going. I, I, I don't know where I'm going. It, is this it? God never said anything, but this is what God did. God provided for him what he needed to get there. God is always going to provide for you what you, that's that God confidence. When people tell you you can't do anything, here's your response. You know what? You're absolutely right. I can't, but the God that's in me can. Why? Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Let, 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 me, let me move quickly. Let me move quickly. Here's the third point. Here's the third point. This one is not as spelled out um, in the text like determined and confidence, but it's right here. Uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna have the ingredients of living your best life, you have to you have to be living a humble life. Here, here it is in the text. Watch the text. He says, and make sure that you obey the whole law that my servant Moses gave you. All right, preacher. So where's the humility in that? Here it is. How many of you have been given directions to how to get somewhere and you thought you knew a quicker or a shortcut to get there? So when they give you what you need to get there, you throw it out because you say, well, if they never got there, obviously what they're giving me ain't going to work. Did, did, did y'all miss that? Here, here, here it is. Here it is. Another way. You, you've been praying to God and asking God for a promotion. And the person that is leaving that office sits down with you and gives you the ABCs to be successful. But you don't have the spirit of humility. So you figure that if you was that good and you did all of this, then why are they moving you out the way and they're promoting me? So what you do is you take what they give you and you throw it aside and then you try to recreate the wheel. Baby, you ain't got to recreate the wheel. Just put your custom rims on them tires and ride on out in your success. See, when I was transitioned, when I was transitioned from youth ministry, uh, and, and, and my wife, my wife can attest to this. When I transitioned from youth ministry, uh, I had created something that St. Paul had never had before. I created a whole youth ministry manual of everything they needed to do to have a successful youth ministry. Well, two people was um, given responsibility to, to take over our youth ministry. And the night that they had a celebration for me, I walked up to them. I gave them a copy of my notebook. Mm -hmm, a copy. I still got the original one um, in my house. I still believe that it works even now. Uh, I gave them a copy. I put it in a nice notebook and I said, here is everything you need to run this ministry successfully. And guess what? They put that thing to a side and they tried to do their own thing and before long the whole thing started falling apart. But here's my humility. I didn't let them fail. I stepped back in and asked them, what do you need? They said, we need to know how you did this and how you did that. I say it's all in the manual that I gave you. Don't make your life hard because you don't want to follow the example of somebody else. Paul told the people, he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Got to move quickly. So God told Joshua to obey. Watch this. And not to neglect any part of the law. Listen, you got to follow God's word to the T. You got to make sure that every I is dotted and every T is crossed. 
problem is when we get when we start going through our, our hardships and our difficulties, um, we start flipping through the word. We start flipping through the word trying to find something. We we start to pray and ask God. God says this. Well, God said, well, listen, I asked, I, I commanded you to give a tenth of what you have. Now, you've been cheating me, so now you want me to bail you out financially? I, 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 I've been instructing you to go to Bible study. Now you want to make an appointment with Bishop Hill because your life is falling apart? Well, if you just would have followed what the man of God taught you last week and you made sure you follow what he taught you week before last, then your life wouldn't be here. But since your life is here, now you want me to bail you out. God said, I ain't obligated to bail you out when you ain't been keeping my law. One of my multiple, one of my multiple stream, my multiple streams of income is credit repair, and the company I'm with have a very clear system. And if I'm gonna be successful at it, I cannot deviate from their system. If I want that money in my account every every Thursday, I need to follow just what those folks tell me, because there's some folks who've been doing it longer than me. They've been doing it better than me, but I thank God that they're willing to share what got them to where they're now. If I think I'm bigger and better than them, and I think that I know the market in Jacksonville better than them, I ain't gonna never survive. But if I notice that the moment I do just what they told me to do, I can't look for the likes. I gotta look for the contracts. So, so when you when, when you don't have this. Um, when, when you think that you can do it outside of what God is instructing you, you operate out of a spirit of arrogance. James 4.10 says, humble yourself in the sight of God, and he shall lift you up. 1 Peter 5 and 6 says, humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you, watch this, in due time. When you have the spirit of humility, you ain't putting a timetable on God. You ain't trying to rush God to give you the best life. You just enjoy the journey to where you're going. See, um, I'm going on my fourth year going over to Africa on a missions trip, and I praise God uh, for my friend, my our bishop, for going. Um, but, but when I got on that airplane and I left um, the United States, I couldn't rush those pilots. I, I had to literally see the sun go down and then see the sun come up on the same plane. Only to get to Amsterdam and have to catch another flight and see the sun up and go down just to get to my destination. So I couldn't think that uh, they need to create a plane that can take you there in a matter of time. No, it's an exact time that God wants you to get the way you're going. You just have to enjoy the scenery. So I love when I fly over to Africa. I, I love looking out the window. I love when I get to the Amsterdam airport. I love being able to shop in the Amsterdam airport and get all my cheap gadgets for less. I love that. But when I get to Africa, I finally thank God that he's gotten me to where I'm going. Listen, it's some things that God wants you to see on this journey. You just need Need to enjoy the view. Here's my final point. My final point is actually in verse 9. When God tells him, be, be determined, be confident, not neglect anything. And then God says this. God says, don't be afraid. So here's your final ingredients. Live a fearless life. Live a furious life. 2 Timothy 1 and 7 tells us that God says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but he's given us power and love and of a sound mind. Most of us are fearful of things, watch this, that we've never seen or done before. Question, how you know you can't do it if you've never done it before? How, how, how you know... How, how you know you can't do it? You know, whenever, I, whenever I'm sharing with young people, I tell young people this all the time, I say, you know what? I believe that I have the capacity in me and my brain is more powerful than anything you've ever seen that I can get on the tallest building of Jacksonville, Florida and jump off and fly. Now I get the same response some of you just gave you laugh. But here's the reality. How I know I can't if I've never done it before? How you know you can't be successful on that job if you've never been in that position on that job? What you afraid of? 
You want to know what produced fear in us? And then I'm done. Here's what produced fear in us. We let contaminated folks contaminate us with the spirit of fear because they failed at what you have been assigned to do. Listen, if God has assigned it for you, then God is going to give you everything you need to accomplish it. But here's the other thing you can remove fear from. You can remove fear when you surround yourself with people who has accomplished what you want to accomplish. Listen, I ain't trying to be funny. But out of 300 leaders from around the world to get on a monthly call with John Maxwell that I literally pay this man $29 a month. You want to know why? Because John Maxwell has achieved some things in leadership that I believe I'm ordained to achieve. So why get fearful? Because I don't know how to do it when I can surround myself with somebody and I can ask somebody a question who has already done it. You ain't got to be afraid to live your best life. Why? Because Jesus has already taught us how to live your best life. What is that best life? They can crucify me on Friday. They can put me in a borrowed tomb on Friday and I can stay there all day long. But here it is. When God decides on Sunday morning, he's going to raise you up to live your best life. Some of you ought to just get excited that God has already ordained for you to live your best life. Don't you be afraid of who walk away. Don't you be afraid of losing anything. You have already lived your best life through Jesus Christ. Everybody standing. That's the best little preacher from the north side can come over to Olive and then do. I ain't Bishop Terry Hill. But that's what God told me to share. Here's the reality. Let me be honest with you all. I, I struggle in church when we make people or get people to believe that they're going to live a life that's not challenging. For a matter of fact, that's not even the word. The Bible says that in life we're going to have trials and tribulations. It comes with life. The reality is is we're going to have to face it at some point. But it's how we face it. And it's who we face it with. Over six years ago, six and a half, seven years ago, my wife walked into a hospital to have what they told us was going to be a simple surgery. Surgery, overnight stay, home on rehab for six weeks and then return to work. Didn't happen didn't happen I walked I walked in that recovery room and she woke up and she said I don't have I don't feel much down my left leg we trusted this doctor for about a year and a half keep telling us it's gonna get better just just think it out it's gonna get better what well, that joker was doing was buying time to let the statue of limitations run out so we couldn't sue him but you know what we didn't put our trust in him or we didn't put our trust in the courts to compensate us for what we thought we deserved. We did pursue an attorney who was going to pick up the case. We thought we had it nailed down. We thought we thought it was coming. I already knew what kind of car I was going to go buy. I was going to go on and pay off the house and bless the church. Didn't happen. But here's what God did. God gave us the wisdom going from two incomes to one to pay off both cars. When sometimes with two incomes, we struggle to pay one car. Then he gave my wife this incredible, incredible gift, something she was doing. And I don't know who this story is getting ready to bless, but something she was doing just for Sunday dinner, making lemonade and tea. She went to an event that she was a part of, and they asked her to bring the drink. She made her, she made her, her lemonade and her tea, and her mentor. But girl, this stuff's so good, you need to sell this. That birthed this whole Paula's punch, and it hasn't been a weekend, and hasn't been a week that my wife ain't made with limited ability. She ain't stood there and squeezed those fresh squeezed lemons. It ain't been a weekend that she ain't made over at least 20 gallons. 
that she sells. Sometimes the hell that you go through is only to birth the resurrection that God wants you to experience with purpose and destiny. You've been complaining about what you're going through. You need to ask God, what's the purpose of me going through it and how you can get glory? So we believe in that manifestation of healing is going to come, but until then, our suffering is for his glory. So I don't know who's in here today and you've been struggling with where life is. Life has thrown you some curveballs and you've had people to walk out your life and leave you. Things have happened. Here's what I want to say to you today, that the only way for you to maintain who you are in God is to be in relationship with God. I want to invite you now to one of the most amazing persons that can give you the most amazing relationship that you ever had. And his name is Jesus Christ. I want everybody to repeat after me if I if I may if I may to the leadership of this church if, if, if I may just do something that we do at St. Paul. I want everybody to repeat after me and if this is your first time repeating a prayer like this, I'm going to ask that you to remain standing while everyone else takes their seat. Can we do that? Just repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for your life-changing word. I received it not in my mind, but in my heart. And my spirit is open to who you are. I stand before you confessing who I am. I'm a sinner. I'm unsaved. I'm outside of my relationship with you. And today, according to your word, Father, you say if I confess and believe that Jesus died and you raised him again, I shall be saved. So that's what I stand to do. I open my heart up to you now and I ask you to come into my life and be my savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If that's your first time praying a confession prayer, I'm going to ask that you to remain standing and everyone takes their seat. And perhaps you have prayed that in a restored state. If you know that you once was in a relationship with God and you strayed away and God is calling you to that amazing relationship, I want you to remain standing today. Here's my third appeal. Life has been a struggle even in your relationship with God because you haven't found a church home to grow in. Let me recommend one to you. No, it's not the one I come from. It's, it's the one that I know. And that's the Citadel Church. What I know is Bishop Hill has a heart for God's people and a heart for the kingdom. And what the Citadel Church is going to offer you is what the Bible says we need is hope. Hope to believe that I can make it another day. Hope that believe that I can make it through whatever I face. If you know you need a church home and you need a place of hope that's going to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask that you would stand now and say, I want to I want to become a part of this fellowship. Now, here's what I want you to do. If you were standing, I want you to make your way to one of the ministers at this altar. If you were standing, make your way. They just want to pray with you. They want to minister to you. They want to love on you. Come on, heaven is rejoicing and so shall we. Come on, they just want to pray with you. They want to minister to you. Now, if you're here, if you're here and life is not where you have been wanted to be, you've, you've had some challenges, some difficulties in life, and you say today, hey, I, I, I want to live this best life. I, I don't want to. I don't want to just say it because it's 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 the end thing. Now I don't want to sing the song because it's a it's a popular song. I want to be the example of living my best life. But I've been going through so much. If that's you and you want God to turn some things, I want you to come to the altar. We just want to pray with you. Who are you? Who are you? Come on, my brother. Come on, my sister. Listen, don't walk out of here the same way. You say, listen, I just won't pray. I just. I just need someone to agree with me to have my best life. Who are you? Who are you? Come on. Come on. Thank you, my sister. Who else? Who else? Who else? Come down to the altar. All the
all the things you've been worried about, all of the all of the stuff that has been stressing you, the Bible says that bring your cares unto me. Who are you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I want my best life. And all kind of stuff has been happening. I want to live out the will and the purpose of God. Who are you? All right, listen. Listen. I don't, I don't want to change protocol, but I do understand that sometimes it's difficult to make that public confession and that public walk. But I believe in invitation. I, listen, if I don't have a time restraint, I do a longer invitation than I preach his word. I believe in fishing. He calls us to be fishermen, fisher of men. I believe in going after souls. But with due, all due respect to the house and the time, here's, here's what I would suggest to you.